Hello everyone and welcome to Social Value Live. My name is Carl Brown. I'm the head of content at Assemble Media Group and I'm chairing this next session, which is all about how companies can create an inclusive culture. Greater inclusivity is something that we, we all want to aim for, or we should all want to aim for in our workplaces. Um, not only is it the right thing to do from a moral sense um, and from a social value point of view, but there have been various pieces of research that have shown that more inclusive and more diverse businesses make better decisions and perform better. And in the current labour market, of course, uh, particularly in construction, we can also ill afford the skills leak of people from the industry due to a lack of inclusivity. So in this session today, we are going to look at best practice in setting up an inclusive culture, looking at what firms can do to tackle the barriers to greater inclusivity, and what policies can be put in place to achieve this. Luckily, we have a fantastic panel today to discuss all of this, who I, I shall now introduce. We have Anouk Khan, who's the Head of Growth at Cambridge Finance, and Zinga Orgil, who's the Founder and CEO at Race Expert, Martin Smith, who's a Project Director at Bureau 4, and Helen Redfern, who's the Chief People Officer at Kia. Each of our panelists will talk for around five to eight minutes, and then we will open the session up to your questions. And please do get involved and ask a question. Um, to do this, you simply need to use the questions box, which you should be able to see on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, but I'm going to stop waffling now and hand over to the first of our presentations. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Anouk Khan from Cambridge Finance. Anouk, over to you. Thank you very much, Carl. I'm super excited to be here with my fellow panelists as well. It's, it's, it's a theme really close to my heart, and I'm really excited to share my presentation, which I hope everyone can now see. Um, can everyone see the presentation? Um, sorry, having trouble loading my presentation, so I'll just run with the notes that I that I have. Um, unless one of you can share it for me, um, Carl. Uh, we'll we'll have a look at that. Okay, fine. No worries. I, I'll wing it. Um, I know my subject anyway. So anyway, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, we're we're here to talk about retaining talent and how to create an inclusive workplace culture. A little bit about myself. My name is Anu Khan. I'm from Pakistan. I was born there. I've studied in school in Egypt and in the UK. I'm still in the School of Life. I lived and worked and lived in Dubai and I'm currently based in Spain. My career goes from working in finance, working at Merrill Lynch Private Bank, now Merrill Lynch Bank of America, to setting up a family office in the UAE, to setting, setting up my own business consultancy in real estate. So really, I'm now working for a small business as well. So I've really done the whole corporate to medium to entrepreneur stage in my life. Um, I'm currently head of growth at Cambridge Finance. Cambridge Finance is a premium provider of real estate finance training uh, for, for financial modeling in Excel. So we work very closely with the built environment, real estate and the construction sector. I'm also co-operations manager for Real Estate Women. Real Estate Women is a diversity network that promotes what, diversity, inclusion and equity for women in the built environment. So the, the, the themes that I'm really passionate about and actually both platforms bring together is, is upskilling via training and also creating a more diverse and inclusive place. So that's me in a nutshell. So what do we mean by inclusion? And I'm pleased that I go first because it's easier to set, to set the, the theme straight. What we mean by inclusion is a place where everybody is treated and respected the same. Uh, it's a place where people have freedom of expression. It's a place where they can build their core competencies. What it's not, and this is very, this is very important, it's not a melting pot. It's not a place for assimilation. This is where we're looking to celebrate people from different backgrounds, different sexual preferences, different people, you know, people of color. So it's not about creating a melting pot. And it's not just, and it's more than diversity because it's easy to say we are a diverse 
workplace or we are a diverse company simply by hiring more people, hiring more women, hiring more people of color. But, but, but creating inclusion is something much more nuanced, much more complicated because it's working on people's psychological motivations. That's, that's speaking about inclusion. So there are two themes I'd like to touch upon here. Um, the first that I'd like to talk about why one of the ways we can create an inclusive workplace is, is looking at the gender and the ethnicity pay gap. So putting on my real estate women's hat on, we conducted, we are now in the process of conducting a very detailed report uh, with Warwick Business School and University of Leicester to look at the pay gap, the gender pay gap in the real estate sector. So for clarification purposes, uh, the gender pay gap does, is not the same as equal pay, where women and men working in the same positions are being paid equally. The gender pay gap is the average pay of all men and the average pay of all women. And we found, with no surprises, that during 2020 and 2021, the median pay gap for the real estate sector as a whole has increased primarily because of COVID and also because in 2019 there was, there was no reporting. And why this is important is because you have to remember when we're talking about gaps, it's, it's, it's a form of bias, whether it's implicit or explicit. So um, to get the pay gap correct is really critical to attract and retain the right kind of talent. And the problem with the, with the gender pay gap is that the way it's set up, it's not fully transparent. It doesn't cover, firstly, it only provides data for senior women, women in senior positions. We have no data for ethnicity pay gaps, so people of color don't know where they stand. Uh, and there's also very little, um, uh, it, it doesn't account for wage disparity for working, people working part-time, people working, you know, people earning bonuses. So the gender pay gap is, is really key to get right, to get transparent. Um, and, it, and it's work in progress for many companies. The second theme I would like to talk about is about training opportunities, or as I would like to say, inclusive training opportunities. So Cambridge Finance, as I mentioned, is a provider of real estate financial modeling. And since the, since the start of our business, since 2016, we can clearly see the demographic of the kinds of people that come to us. And I think it's more obvious when we see corporates asking for in-house training, and then really the, the split is stark. We're only seen as seeing a certain demographic of white male coming to us. There are very few women, and if we talk about people of color, men or women, it's almost non-existent. So we realized as a small company, we're a three person company, that we also have a role to play because part of our ethos, because we know that our training impacts people's careers and their lives. With this training, they can get a better job, demand a better salary or set up their own business. So knowing that we set up, we have a scholarship fund set up. It's partially funded by us, but it opens the door for people coming from minority backgrounds, which we know in general, and I'm sure Nzinga will, will clarify more of that in, in her presentation, is that people from min minority backgrounds struggle with more financial difficulties. So we are offering a platform to help to help create inclusive training. So our training is, is reaching people from different backgrounds uh, and, and different educational backgrounds as well. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're working in partnership with groups such as Black Women in Real Estate, that black professionals in construction, we rise because it's all about creating collaboration to make sure we, 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 hit, we hit the right people. We're also slowly asking our clients, you know, a few difficult questions that why are there no women? Are there no women in the transactional side? Uh, why are we not seeing people of color? You know, so we, we're trying to ask these difficult questions and, and it's work in progress because, you know, we are a small company. We, we can't, we can't be too, we can't nudge them too much. We also need to earn our paycheck, but we're doing what we can. So in terms of, um, what, what do we see as solutions? I, I think there are a number of solutions that companies can take. Um, and one is, you know, firstly, as simply as check in with your employees, check in with your employees, see how they feel about the current environment. Um, are they happy? Where can they see change? 
Uh, the second is I'm a big believer in training. You know, all of us have biases, and I think having some kind of subconscious bias training, but on a regular basis, is key because it's one thing to have training once a year, and you know, people forget. I think it's important to expand beyond HR because it's about everyone being playing a role and creating and, and creating inclusion and being and being sort of a change maker themselves. Um, it's also about um, yeah, it's, it's about creating partnerships. For example, you know, tap into external networks like ours, real estate women. We we you know we do a lot of roundtables. People come and speak to us in confidence. So it's very important for especially the big companies out there to maybe tap to external networks to see what people are thinking, feeling, and what's really going on in the sector. So that's my introduction. I hope it's been helpful, um, and I look forward to receiving questions. And I look forward to hearing from the rest of my team here. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Anouk. That was, um, I thought that was a really great start, actually, because it, it set the scene really well. And um, some useful thoughts there about, I mean, firstly, what we actually mean by inclusivity, and then some, um, some good points on the gender pay gap and the importance of training. Um, we're now going to go to our next panellist, who is Enzinga Orgil, who's the founder of Race Expert. Enzinga, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, really looking forward to today and hope you are as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to share a very quick presentation just to kind of give you a little bit of context around my experiences and um, some of the useful things I found in, in managing race and culture and ethnicity in the construction industry. So my name is Enzingo Orgil. I'm born and raised in Birmingham, moved to London and embarked on a wonderful career within the aviation construction industry. What do I do? I am founder and CEO of Race Expert Limited, and I'll tell you why I set the consultancy up in a little while. What is Race Expert Limited? Well, it's a consultancy that looks at supporting organizations within the construction industry in removing and eliminating the barriers that are caused through race and ethnicity. And this could be creating anti-racism strategies. This could be looking at representation of senior leadership with people of color. And it uses innovation and existing resources and capabilities. So rather than looking everywhere else for the solutions, actually looking internally for the solutions. And why do I set up Race Expert Limited? Well, as a black woman within the construction industry, I found it extremely challenging. I found that often I was overlooked for opportunities. I was silenced in meetings. And to be quite honest, I found that the experience was quite traumatic. And I know I'm not the only person who's experienced this. So for me, I thought rather than sitting down and doing nothing about it, my call to action was to get involved and to get behind changing the narrative and moving the dial positively. So some interesting statistics about, you know, what's happening within the construction industry around ethnic diversity. First of all, you know, 6% of the construction industry in the UK is ethnically diverse. And this is in comparison to roughly around 30% of the whole UK. When you think about the number of people in the construction industry that are ethnically diverse, 1% of them are senior leaders and directors. So already we can see there's a lack or a disparity between what we've got at leadership level and what we've got within organizations. And then you've also got the fact that 76% of people that are culturally diverse feel that they face discrimination in relation to career progression because of their race or ethnicity, which quite frankly is, is unacceptable, especially if we're striving and pushing towards more of an inclusive and equitable environment. Next slide, please. So for me, it's around finding solutions. We do a lot of talking about this. I'd be very challenged to find anyone in 2022 who needs any more awareness about racism, okay? It's now time to move into action. So there are five ways in which I can identify that you could use to help you tackle these problems. The first is around data, gathering qualitative and quantitative data, and also tracking the information from where people have chosen not to disclose details about themselves and understand why. Then use that data to create a strategy, identifying pain points, putting together an action plan and aligning with performance metrics. The third step is external support. If you haven't got the resources and capabilities within your organization to move the race agenda forward, you need to go out and find it or else it's not going to work and it's not going to be well embedded. Once you've done that, looking at your existing resources and capabilities, do you have ER, you know, ERG groups? Do you have L&D groups that can support in this? And how are we being more innovative rather than just copying and pasting what's being done in other industries and thinking that's the right solution for yours? And the final step 
is action, review, and lessons learned. As a project manager, it's so important to review what you're doing, check against what your targets are, and actually capturing the lessons learned so you're able to share them and also celebrate them. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers and deterrents that need to be removed? This list is endless. Let me be clear about that. There are a couple of things that I've captured. I won't go into every single one of them as you can see them on the slide. But you know, around hiring and recruitment, are you adding for culture, you know, add or are you adding for culture fit? It's really important we're creating an embracing environment where people can come in being their true authentic selves and they can showcase their talents within that space. You know, are you looking at skills as opposed to qualifications? Certain people from different backgrounds might not have had access to the same opportunities around education. So how are you making sure you're getting that diverse talent pool? And are you using agencies that have access to diverse talent? You know, engagement and communication is so important. You know, tokenistic gestures like black squares and virtual signaling, it puts people off because it's not sincere and it compromises in the integrity of an organization. It's about taking action and actually meaning that action and being intentional behind that action. Creating safe spaces that are free from professional consequences so people can speak up. Remove banter. The amount of times I heard that on site, oh, it's a bit of banter. Is it to you because it's a bit of microaggression to me? So let's remove that. Gaslighting and terms like BAME, BME. And then finally, just really having a look at where your strategy is. If you have a strategy and if you don't have one, creating one having a look at your policies and understanding what your metrics are and realizing if your organization is set up structurally and design wise to allow for an inclusive culture. Next slide, please. So a couple of incentives and policies to think about. And again, this is endless. And what I've tried to do here is align it to the people within the organization that you potentially can be rolling this out to. So in inclusive leadership programs, that's a really fantastic opportunity to really allow people to understand what it takes to be an inclusive leader and to actually encourage them to embark on that journey to become better as inclusive leaders. You know, creating a you know, suitable, feasible and viable business case. Why do we need more diversity and inclusion? Why do we need more representation from people from racial ethnic backgrounds. What is the purpose behind that? A purpose could be to you know, attract talent and clients from emerging markets. Think about that. Having the right governance and monitoring in place. It's no point just having these policies and having these frameworks without anyone checking and monitoring that they're working. How are people capturing incidents and reporting them? You know, colleagues and employees that might encounter discrimination, who are they going to? How is it captured? How is it recorded? And what is being done about it? And finally, scenario based immersive training. You know, we've all sat through those eight hour training sessions about unconscious bias or something else where we've been talked, talked about, you know, how to be more inclusive. What about putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that we're talking about and really understanding what those challenges look and feel like? Next slide, please. So that's me. I'm really looking forward to hopefully answering some questions during today's session. If you want to contact me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm the only Enzinga or Gil you'll find on there. And alternatively, if you like a device, scan the QR code. It'll take you straight to my website and my LinkedIn page. Thank you very much, Carl. Thanks, um, thanks Enzinga. Uh, that was great. And um, it was um, really interesting um, to hear about your personal experience of working in the construction industry as a black woman and it was also a great run through setting out some key steps for firms to take um, the the stuff you said right at the end there in Zynga about how uh, how it's about uh, it should be more about putting yourself in the shoes of, of, of other people that are affected I think that's probably something we can return to in the questions uh, towards the end end of the session uh, but I am going to uh, move on now to uh, Martin Smith, who is Project Director at Bureau 4. Martin, I think you're muted. Right. Have we uh, have we lost Martin? I think we may we may have lost Martin, but um, I think what I might do is go to uh, 
Helen Redfern, who's the Chief People Officer at Kia, and then we can hopefully come back to Martin in a few minutes. So, Helen, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'll just, anyone can nod on the panel, just checking. Yeah, fabulous. Okay. Um, so lovely to um, be able to talk to you about um, this, this topic, which is very close to my heart. Um, my name is Helen Redfern. I'm the Chief People Officer at Kia. Um, we're a leading construction and infrastructure services company. Um, and our purpose is to sustainably deliver infrastructure, which is vital to the UK. Um, so we do everything from building new schools, um, providing learning facilities, keeping the lights and water running, the highways moving. And we have um, 11,000 fantastically capable people delivering across the UK every day. Um, so I joined um, the construction sector um, coming into Keir just coming up to 10 years ago. Um, I joined as HR director um, and similarly had some quite challenging experiences as one of perhaps the only senior female leaders in the organisation and certainly know what it can feel like on a personal level not to have your voice heard. Um, and I have two children, so I have Sophie and William, who are eight and seven. Um, and when I was expecting um, Sophie, my first child, um, I couldn't even find the group's maternity policy. Um, so I think for me, it's been a personal mission to start to drive change and create a more diverse and inclusive culture because one, it's the right thing to do um, and it's a commercial imperative. So this is a strategic priority for Keir um, and coming back to this is not a HR issue, this is a business wide issue that has to be tackled um, for, from every level and creating an inclusive culture means an environment where everybody is comfortable, that they bring them whole selves to work no matter what. Um, and that is certainly our driving aspiration within Keir. Um, our people strategy centres around four core pillars. Diversity and inclusion is, um, of course, one of those. Um, and people at the heart of our business. We are a people business. Um, we launched our people strategy and as part of that, um, DNI piece, we engaged with some external support, which was actually referenced um, earlier, um, to really give us that technical expertise um, and hold up a mirror to the organisation in terms of where we actually were um, and what we needed to do to improve. So we engaged with Involve, um, carried out an audit across all of our processes. Um, we had focus groups, we completed an engagement survey um, and the response to those, um, that audit was actually really difficult to read um, because the experiences of some of our people were not where we wanted them to be. Um, but I think accepting reality and then tackling what you're being told and presented with is, is very important. Um, what we did is um, we recognised, say, that some of our colleagues were experiencing um, unacceptable microaggressions um, and we launched our diversity and inclusion roadmap um, in response to some of the feedback that we had and the priorities we needed to focus on. And that's published on our website. Um, it's our strategy through to 2026. Um, and we monitor and progress our um, actions and where we are tracking against that DNI roadmap, which is say it's very visible for everybody to see. Um, and in July 2021, using again the feedback that we had through the survey, we launched our Expect Respect campaign. Um, it's a group um, wide campaign um, and we have gone and educated all of our employees around our expectations um, of them in respect to the workplace um, and reiterated our zero tolerance approach to bullying and harassment. It's a very hard hitting campaign 
um, we wanted it to be. So we have posters, we have hoardings, um, and those use quotes that are obviously anonymised but that came through um, as a result of the survey. And we have five respect basics. Um, we have five safety basics. And for us, um, safety, um, inclusion, and our approach to expect respect sit side by side um, in terms of importance. Um, as I say, all of our employees have been tra tra trained. Um, we launched a call us out helpline so that people could call us um, on a confidential basis through um, a completely independent line um, if they experience something that they want to talk um, to us about in confidence. Um, and as I say, over the last year, we have seen a huge momentum in a positive way towards conversations that are happening across the business. Um, the next phase is to keep the programme alive, so we have more training um, and also we're working, um, very important for us with our um, huge supply chain on ensuring that the expect respect is rolled out across um, all of our supply chain as well. Um, inclusive policies um, are really important. I spoke about my personal experience when I went on maternity leave. We need to attract and we need to retain talent and there is a real war for talent out there. Um, and I think your policies have to reflect the organisational culture that you want to create. Um, so what have we done? We have um, enhanced our areas such as maternity, adoption and shared parental leave. Um, we've introduced eight weeks paternity leave at full pay. Um, we have the industry's first pregnancy loss policy, um, which includes two weeks paid leave um, for people who've gone through a really difficult experience. And we want to support everybody, regardless of what's going on in, in their life at a particular time. Um, menopause, so we provide um, clear support um, and expectations for both managers um, and our colleagues on menopause. Um, and of course, we've introduced agile working um, as well across the organisation, really encouraging managers and people to think about different ways of working um, in what has perhaps been seen as a traditional sector in the past and one that we want to modernise and reflect that lots of different people can come and work in this fantastic sector where we produce fantastic projects all of the time and we want everyone to feel they can be part of that. Um, we also have a volunteering policy and really importantly um, we have our networks so in line with our DNI roadmap and expect respect campaign we established the Keir inclusion network um, and we have broader networks uh, as well um, so we have our racial inclusion gender inclusion ability network LB LGBT plus and allies network we have a network for armed forces um, and also for menopause and each of those networks, um, I think role modelling and executive sponsorship are key. Um, this has to be driven across all um, areas of the business. So each of those networks is sponsored by the Exco. Um, and we had a meeting, a committee meeting, which is um, chaired by the chief executive and myself, where we hear from each of the network leads and the passion and the commitment that people are putting in in their own personal time um, through work time to make change and drive actions is something that i feel really proud about for ikea um, because you can see the changes that are happening um, and the commitment so um, really positive inclusive recruitment I think everybody's um, spoken about the importance of getting it right if you don't get it right when you're hiring um, of course it's self-fulfilling and it becomes a huge challenge so we've done a lot of um, upskilling um, and also we have our making ground program where we're proactively working with prison leavers to try and provide um, employment opportunities and skills and retraining um, when they leave prison and also we have a strong connection with the armed forces um, providing opportunities for those who um, are coming out of the armed forces we're giving them reskilling and again career opportunities um, and most recently we've joined a consortium with refugee to provide support to refugees 
both through employment and language skills and training. Um, I went to um, a dinner on Monday actually with refugees and heard some very inspiring personal stories from um, those who have gone through unimaginable experiences um, and just the support that charity gives is absolutely fantastic so really pleased to be part of that. Um, how do we know that what we're doing is working? Um, well we do do a lot of engagement surveys, data, data, data. Um, we have um, strong data in places but we are looking to improve this so we're doing a data capture at the moment to enhance the statistics and we've also launched a dashboard so that we can track things like promotions, hiring, um, are we actually doing what we need to do and making the difference. Um, employee advocacy is key so we launched um, a campaign called I'm Proud um, and that's where hundreds and hundreds of our employees have taken to social media to share what they're proud about and share with the world what they think about working at Keir. Um, and the volume of comments around our approach to inclusion and being able to bring your whole self to work um, and being a supportive employer really came across in a number of those um, statements that our people made. Um, we have got a lot to do. So whilst it sounds like we're making really good momentum and progress, which we are, um, we're on a journey that's going to take many, many years. Um, but we are really committed to it. So hopefully that's just given you a little bit of an insight um, and I'll hand back over now. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And um, it was certainly useful to learn of all the things that Keir is doing on that journey. Um, and I thought, I thought, I thought there was a key point early on there about inclusivity being a commercial priority for Keir, and not something that's kind of siphoned off to to HR. Um, and I'd, I'd be interested, maybe later, to uh, get the panelists' thoughts on whether that is the way. Uh, whether, whether you think it, that's the way that it's seen more widely, widely across the construction industry. But um, I'm going to move on now to uh, Martin, who's uh, rejoined us, uh, thankfully. Um, and Martin is the project director at Bureau 4. Martin, over to you. Hello, finally, I think we're working. I think we're working. Um, my laptop seems to seems to want to do Microsoft updates, which is never a good thing in this heat. Um, so um, I'm uh, Martin Smith from Bureau 4. I'm a project director. I head up the uh, commercial offices sector as well as DNI at Bureau 4. My experience on the uh, on in terms of inclusion within businesses um, it started from when I started in construction during the last recession, which was um, uh, where you take any job during 2009-10. So I did a lot of working for contractors, estimating, working in uh, uh, port cabins and the like, and then went on to do uh, a graduate role in the square mile, um, of which I wasn't out uh, up until the first year of um, being in the square mile, which is not uncommon with 80% of graduates going back into the closet from university into the workplace. Um, I was actively involved in a networking group called Freehold LGBT and with that they gave me a mentor in order to help me with my APC process which is the chartership process. Um, by return I then planned the first Pride, London Pride for uh, Freehold, the first property or building sector uh, walking group uh, since Pride began um, in the uh, 2011 I think it was with the RICS which was unheard of back then um, and then I repaid the favour by acting as a mentor for various freehold members and um, so that reverse mentoring program is really good in terms of capturing that from externals. Since I've joined Bureau 4 which is a project management uh, company in construction um, I then um, influenced the business in terms of developing a DNI strategy, as well as being voted in co-chair of Building Equality in London, which does have an L which is an LGBT plus focused um, uh, uh, network group with many organizations signed up, including the likes of Kia, which are in this, in this call. Um, so obviously I have to know, I respect my own biases, which is I focus a lot on that. However, 
as my work at Bureau 4, I cover all different, all attributes of, of diversity and inclusion. And my real uh, pet hate is documents, no action, and uh, also uh, uh, what what's going on at site level, because many d and I sort of discussions talk about mid management, upper management. What is actually going on at site level? Um, we work in construction. Um, uh, men under 45, the biggest uh, 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 the biggest cause of death is suicide, of which the highest sector of that is working in construction. So we need to sort of work on those um, playing fields. But um, in terms of where we are, and, I, and this is something I talked about at London Build last year, is that. Um, we're working in a background of society at the moment where we're, we're getting a lot more um, divided um, and the, the rise of hate crime in London specifically and the UK. Um, so in London, um, it's shocking that uh, it re hate crime reached its 10 year high last summer. Um, for LGBT plus, there was 400 um, offences recorded in the month of June alone um, and about 3,200 in the last 12 months which is um, an increase of nearly a thousand from 2019. So it's gone up a third. Um, it's deeply concerning. Um, and it's uh, about 44 offenses last year a day in London alone. And if you extrapolate that and talk to uh, charities like Stonewall, 80% of offenses aren't even report reported. But going back to the industry with construction news, can I talk about construction news on a building magazine uh, talk? I am. Um, so uh, they carried out a survey to their readers and um, of about over a thousand responders in the construction industry, it didn't create a, a construction industry in a good light. The overriding feedback was that homophobia was still an issue. Um, and statistics show that um, how many face LGBT phobic abuse at work, 28%. How many people are not open at work, 54%. How many people have heard the word gay as an insult, nearly 60%. And how many has seen working in the construction industry as a negative impact on their mental health at 31%. Now that question you can extrapolate for many other people uh, as well who work in the industry, I would say, because of the pressure we're under and the tight budgetary constraints uh, and margins we all need to work to. And then 60% of people saw it as a career progression. Um, there has been a slight improvement on statistics a, a year ago with the Stonewall report, with 18% of people being uncomfortable at work, but that is UK wide. Um, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, what I'm trying to say is what we're fighting for today and what we're trying to create a work for me personally, and I'm a project director, just below the directors, I feel more comfortable at work and safer at work than I do on London streets. Um, and that is a sad reality that people are facing um, in, in terms of um, Bureau Four's involvement on this. Um, we we do uh, are doing things with Pride Munch in internally and allies training, which if you go on Building Equality's website, all our training is available for free. Um, uh, including allyship, and I've delivered that to various stakeholders and, and subcontractors. Um, but as a business, we 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 write into our building contracts. Uh, we amend the prelims of all building contracts to make sure that there's a first mental health first aider on site at all times. The LGBT plus mental health awareness, money matters, race. Um, the list goes on and on. Toolbox talks are delivered on site and recorded on the health and safety monthly report. Um, and, and we check that um, and um, they're, they're just some of the initiatives. Another one would be um, in property, it's all about who you know um, and that goes back to the whole class aspect of um, property uh, and class I believe is the biggest restrictor in terms of the whole diversity uh, piece uh, which not many people talk about um, but in terms of class then so uh, we need who you know. So if you're doing a network event after work, Bureau 4 will pay a uh, carer's allowance for uh, either caring for children, an elderly relative, disabled uh, uh, family member. Um, so you can go to that event and you can mix with those people without being financially uh, penalised for it. Um, they're just some of a flavour I'm, I'm into, but also <laughs> I'm a 
I'm a trustee of uh, AIDS Memory UK, which is building the first AIDS memorial in London for the first time. It's going to be the AIDS memorial. Um, uh, I'm dealing with many companies offering pro bono work for consultation starting next month to build that. And um, I, I believe that sort of action, you know, queering public space, there's a report about it. Uh, I'm going off, I can talk on and on. Uh, 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 queering public space produced by Arup, which we, which I launched last year with building equality. That, and in terms of queering then as a public space, you might think, oh, okay, it's just for LGBT plus. But actually, if you start to implement those um, recommendations, it then creates the streets safer for women, for um, people um, with mobility users. It kind of impacts everyone in terms of the safety on the streets. Um, and and um, uh, another point as well, I'll finish on this, is we know in some industries where uh, banter is rife, and we know that in construction, um, what isn't helping the situation is private WhatsApp messages and groups on site between um, construction uh, professionals and operatives, which do, uh, and I have seen it and I have been shown it, uh, homophobic, misogynistic, uh, uh, I won't even call them memes, I just call them insulting images circulated. And if we look at what's happened in the police service recently and, and all that background, there is a cause and we haven't implemented it here yet, but there is a way of um, trying to implement on site that those sorts of messaging uh, apps which are private and encrypted and your business has no see on them and can't show them that some form of like ms teams chat facility should be made available in in lieu of so it's completely tracked of what's happening and people have a safe way to communicate because at the moment there isn't that um so I've, I've, i'm going to go off my box and i'm going to go back into the questions and uh, uh, back over to carl Thanks, Martin. That was, that was absolutely fantastic. And um, uh, some of those statistics there around prejudice, prejudice and discrimination in the industry uh, uh, really illustrate the, the scale of the problem. Um, I'm going to move on to the Q&A now. We have several uh, questions from the audience and I'm going to ask a few questions as well. Uh, I'm not really sure where to start, but maybe we should start with um, with, with, with something that uh, Anzinga um, talked about earlier about the importance of getting people within a within a, a company to put themselves in other people's shoes and to try and understand um, uh, understand some of the issues from from other people's point of view um, I just wondered in singer whether you have some thoughts in a bit more detail about how companies can can do that Absolutely, Carl. So obviously I um, mentioned earlier about the quantitative, um, qualitative data and collecting that, hearing people's experiences, but also really understanding as an organisation if you have cultural competence and you're culturally intelligent. You know, do you understand and appreciate the experiences that are encountered by people within your organisation? Do you really get what they go through? Do you understand what it means to sometimes present yourself to a room of people where nobody looks like you and you are already feeling outsided and othered? And really understanding what can then be done to negate or mitigate against that. You know, putting it out there that you are an inclusive organization by getting people cultural competency training, getting people cultural intelligence training. So they're able to think about how they communicate with people, how they physically are around other people and how they can bring people into spaces where they might quite honestly feel quite uncomfortable. You know, when I think of inclusive organisations that I've been part of, and I think of the ones that haven't been particularly inclusive, the ones that have made me feel comfortable, made me feel welcome, allowed me to enter into spaces where I might be the only person's person is the one that, you know, I remember as being inclusive. The ones where I felt I'm different, and I've been reminded of it every single time I've either opened my mouth or suggested an idea or done anything has made, you know, has, has, has led me towards thinking that's an inclusive culture. So for me, I think it's just really important to think about, you know, talking to your staff, talking to people, actively listening to them, 
not just saying, yeah, yeah, I get your point. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that with me. Thank you for rehashing your trauma. I'm now going to go off and just carry on with my day. It's actually really listening and understanding what you can do and what role you can play. It doesn't have to be, let's save the world. It can be small steps and thinking about, well, actually, that person's new to the team or well, that person seems to be sitting by themselves. How can I bring them in? How can I draw them in? Or well, that person isn't speaking in a meeting. How can I invite them into the conversation so I can hear their opinion, their perspective? Hey, thank, thanks for that, Ansika. Does anyone else want to come in on, on that, uh, that question? Luke? I mean, I'd like to just expand on that. I mean, I think Nzinga touched on it so eloquently and, and so passionately. I think it's just going back to one of the points I made, that it should be extended to everybody. I think it shouldn't just come, come down to part of um, I know Helen's doing an amazing job at CARE, it's a big organization, but once you spread that everyone is part of creating an inclusion culture in a workplace and everyone is part of the process, and I think that process of hearing, accepting, trying to understand the differences and not othering other people should hopefully become part and part of the culture when you walk into the organization. So it's not just held in one sort of office where you open the door, you shut the door, you sit, you have this chat, this trauma exchange and then you leave the door and the door closes if it's part and parcel of the culture at every layer at every floor at every cubicle then it's much easier to kind of make it make it infuse it you know like inject it as opposed to just saying well come and talk to Helen she'll solve it I mean Helen is just one person but there's a lot of people surrounding Helen who can actually support her and be part of the journey with her so just just to expand on that point but yeah I mean, and from, from 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 a um, my perspective at Bureau Four, one of the things we do is we do offer a lifestyle allowance for people to to learn different skills that are non related to work to mix with people outside their comfort zone as well as volunteer days. I think it's very important for people with middle and high management uh, specifically. Um, Get themselves out of their their routine and mix with um, diverse groups and, and people um, one of the things we do do in terms of behavior is as part of the technical skills and the behavioral skills you need in project management one of the behavioral skills is diversity inclusion it has its own topic it is done it is reviewed in yearly reviews with every employee they are scored on it based on what we feel about their attributes and we ask for 360 feedbacks by the people they manage and the people that are around them on their teams um, once you tell someone, sorry, you're not going to get promoted because we've experienced this and you're scored this on this mandatory competency, you seem to get attention on the fact that this is important to the business it, it, in terms of retention as well, because if people do not feel included or sitting by themselves and stuff like that, where's their line manager? Who's working with the project team? How are they allowing that to happen? You know, and that goes back to all of your points. Okay, Helen, I think you had your hand raised a few minutes ago. Did you want to come in on that point? So, so I'll just I'll make it quick because I'm conscious of probably those questions, but just the other thing that we're um, doing with our, um, so we have a programme for um, our sort of diverse um, populations, um, if they're not in the um, sort of majority group, um, which is around leadership. And again, we've engaged with an external um, expert to help us with that program we had self nominations for it and it's incredible how many people have put themselves forward and as part of that we're just about to start reverse mentoring um so participate participants on that program will be reverse mentoring leaders in the organization and that's all about again listening and getting feedback from the lived experiences of people so we can seek to understand more um because it's just Coming back to all the other comments, so important that you get that feedback. Okay, th thanks, Helen. Um, I'm going to take a question from the audience now. Um, uh, quite a long question, but it, it's a good one, I think. It's from uh, Fiona Lowe, and she wants to know, um, and it's a question for the, the panel generally. Um, do you think that in some cases or circumstances, the categorization of diverse characteristics is part of the issue? Labeling people can encourage a feeling of otherness, both for those individuals and for others in their perceptions of them. Are there any thoughts you have on how we can move away from that kind of discourse and into considering inclusivity more broadly? Quite a lot to unpack there, but does... Um, I can start on that. I can yeah. start on that. 
when you're doing HR or policy at your company, think about intersectionality. Everyone's diverse by their very nature. Think of the iceberg of visibility. Um, Google it if you can. I mean, what you see and what other people and um, what people are, and what makes them up. Um, you know, intersectionality and label it and uh, versus labeling. I mean, ultimately, like I said about the carers allowance, we were covering every dam every form of possible caring that people need to do. Because originally, when HR approached me about it, they were just saying, oh, people with children. I was like, no, 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 it has to cover more than that. Um, so that's how I come across it in terms of um, uh, labeling um, or non-labeling, if you know what I mean. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, everyone's diverse. What these networks do, these LGBT plus um, uh, women networks, that they create a safe space, and they create a space where people can create their own networks, and they also will offer um, networking um not networking mentoring opportunities more than likely um which is very good to get someone outside your business perspective because sometimes um people feel a lot more confident to discuss their career and their progression and what they're facing with an external um but yeah i mean you know uh you you, you you're talking to the converted on intersectionality i'm i'm there i'm i'm with you yes yes any any other Anybody else want to come in on that? I'm happy to add, Carl. I think it's a really interesting point. And I think in an ideal world where we had an equitable and inclusive culture, we would be able to remove and eliminate labels. But the reality of the situation is people have different experiences based on those protected characteristics. So to remove that will actually diminish potentially the opportunity to focus and spotlight on those experiences. So whilst I understand sometimes it isn't particularly nice to feel labeled, to not be even recognized or to you know be be re referred to is is probably even worse and to do the work we need to acknowledge where the work and where the focus needs to be once the work's been done and once we're living in an ideal environment then absolutely we are all part of the same human race you know but at the moment people from protected characteristics have different experiences so we need to honor and actually reflect and talk about that Okay, um, I'm going to move on because we want to get through some more of these questions. Um, there's a question from Karen Wood, who wants to know, um, I mean, this, this is obviously for construction firms, but how do you influence your supply chain to follow the good principles and practice that you are introducing or promoting on inclusivity? I'm happy to take a view on that. So, you know, we select the supply chain that we work with um, and we make our expectations clear with our supply chain. Um, and, you know, we have had scenarios on sites where behaviour has not been acceptable in our supply chain and we have had to remove them from site. Um, our number one ambition is, of course, to work with and provide the communication, training and support that we are doing across the rest of KIA um, so that we're educating and communicating and partnering. But, you know, we have to make sometimes decisions about who we're prepared to work with. And if the culture and the values don't reflect the one that we're trying to create, this will never work. So um, that's our approach to supply chain. I will else? say, I, I will say that it comes from. Yes, it, you can say construction companies, but ultimately they're driven by cost. Um, we look construction industry works on very low margins. A lot of developers and clients want you to sign up to pledges or uh, non-enforceable um, targets. Uh, there's no stick on that. Um, what people need to realise, and I've said this before. If you've got low prelims, which is the management of your site, what do you think that means to the workers on site? What do you think the, the lived experience of the workers are going to be? So, dear clients, if you want an inclusive site, pay the right price and ensure that you've got the right contract terms to ensure that inclusion is there. Um, and main contractors can do that with their subcontractors as well. But it does start from it's the client that sets the tone unfortunately and and sometimes the clients are are not institutional developers are fine in the sense of 
they have policies, they have all this stuff. But if you've got a new client to London, they've got they're a they're um, a company of two, and they've just been brought in from overseas and etc. That's not going to be top of their mindset. Um, and sometimes you have to educate that um, an inclusive site is a safe site. So you link it to health and safety, and then that's where you can create real change. If I if I, if I add. The one person that died in the Crossrail development was um, a guy that was listening to a toolbox talk that wasn't delivered in his language. No one identified it, and he was in the wrong area during a concrete pour, and he died. So the head, uh, head of Crossrail then started to sort of take action on terms of inclusion and make sure that you know everything was in the right languages, and there was a full audit of their employees. So it is, you know, it's really important when you're discussing things like, such as that. Um, I might I might move on um, and I, I'm kind of like combining a, a couple of things in, in one go here but um, I, I was just wondering what what you think inclusivity looks like uh, at site level uh, and Helen I think you talked about making sure your your policies match the culture of the organization that you want to want to create uh, the culture you're trying to create so Presumably, what, what we're saying is, is that inclusivity doesn't look the same everywhere and is one size fits all. Um, so I just wondered, you know, how, how do you know what inclusivity, how do you know when you've got an inclusive culture, basically? I think there's a number of ways that you, you have to measure it. So speaking to your people and constantly getting that feedback. Um, and looking at whether you are attracting people into your organisation and most importantly when they join your organisation are they staying um, because that's when you know if people want to stay in your organisation from an inclusive point of view um, you know you have to be doing the right things and you have to be acting on feedback um, and you have to reflect the communities that you work within and operate within and I think coming back to that point around data you know, every action that we take, we have to track and, and monitor to make sure that we are progressing in the right way. The cultural survey piece, the engagement survey piece, looking at glass door racing. So what are people saying about your company externally? So that if people are thinking about joining you, they're having hopefully a positive experience. Um, so I think there's lots of touch points that need to be considered to work out whether you genuinely are making a difference and that's why we've introduced some of the dashboards and reporting so we talk about inclusive hiring well are we actually getting um, the right mix from an applicant perspective but really importantly are we converting at the right level are our promotions tracking at the right level so um, it's very multifaceted i think for us okay anybody else on um how do we know when your organisation is um, inclusive? I mean, it, it's a bit difficult now because you've, uh, since the pandemic, pandemic, everyone's kind of their own company in a way because they're managing their time, there's lots of flexibility, rah, rah, rah. And actually what, what that's shown is a lot of uh, the average time people are in companies has now reduced, I think, to 2.7 years or less. So if you're having a conversation with your um, <laughs> employee, um, and they say, where are you in five years' time? The reality is they'll be gone. They'll learn what they want from your business and leave. Um, what you can do from a retention perspective is to make sure there's correct procedures and inclusive processes, that there's promotion opportunities, that then that doesn't let uh, the rep and roll of people leaving businesses, because that has a significant cost to a business, as everyone knows. Uh, in, in the fit-out world, one of the golden rules we say is a tenth of your cost as a business is your property. The other 90% is your labour cost. So that's your biggest cost. So you need to spend your money on your people. And that's it, at every level. <clears throat> okay, anybody else want to come in? I think for myself, just to add, Carl, you know, as someone who's obviously um, worked in the construction space and been out in the construction environment to see what inclusivity looks like at site level, I think the first thing is, yeah, absolutely, the people, we need to get the right people in, 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 in place. We need to have the right systems and structures and processes, but also the right infrastructure. 
you know, the amount of times I've walked around in a hard hat and walked into a restroom area and seen inappropriate pictures of women up and I'm thinking, we're in 2020, you know, at the time. Like, why are we still seeing this? Why does this still have to be an issue that I feel uncomfortable about? And then I feel like I'm being made to feel guilty for asking for it to be removed. You know, it's about having restroom facilities, silly little things like that, you know. I go on a construction site and I'm having to walk to the other side of the site to find a toilet because guess what? It's predominantly male. So there's nothing available to me. So it's, it goes deeper than just the people, processes and systems. It's also what happens actually on site. You know, are the notifications and publications and notices you're putting up, do they have people that look like me in them? Or is it all the same look and the same type of people? Do I feel like I belong in that space, that my health and safety is important and I'm a priority? If I can't see any of those things, I'm going to think, well, why on earth am I here? So I think, you know, absolutely everything that Helen and Martin have said, but also just actually what those physical spaces look and feel like as well. And is there accessibility for everybody? And to back, back you up on that, if you look at, um, consider contractor scoring, their policy is that women's toilets should be locked. It hasn't been changed. Why? CITB, a health and safety card, CSCS card. There are apparently only two genders. That's all you can apply for. I've raised it with them six months ago, maybe eight months ago, still not changed. They're blaming their supply chain because they use IT software. Well, it's not good enough. It doesn't represent the industry and the Londoners I know. So, you know, there's, there's institutions at play here that need to sort of step up their game big time. Okay, and that's, uh, that's a very uh, robust uh, uh, view to, to end on. We, we've actually run out of time, believe it or not. It's gone, it's gone very quickly. Um, there's been a hugely uh, valuable discussion and, and, and lots to think about. Um, so I'd just like to thank thank our panel. So I'd like to thank Anouk and Zinga and Martin and Helen. Um, we have more social value sessions coming up tomorrow. I think we've got one on embedding social value pre-construction and then we've got one um, which will discuss case studies showing social value in action. Um, as you all log off you should be presented with a feedback survey uh, about this session. Please do fill it in as it helps us shape the content of um, future sessions like this. Uh, but that's all. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks.